you four images. And what I'll lead up to in the end, uh, about uh, 12 or 15 minutes from now, is whether or not we're going to go back to the moon and Mars. And of course, as an academic, the answer is it all depends. But I'll tell you exactly what it depends upon when we get there. First of all, this is an image from the March 22nd, 1952 issue of Collier's Magazine. It's an image of space exploration that I grew up with. You'll probably recognize the objects on either side of this painting by Chesley Bonestell. One is a large rotating space station providing artificial gravity. And at the other side of the picture is a winged space shuttle, which is the forerunner of the modern space shuttle. But the strange object that's in the center is of the most interest of all historically. That object is the precursor to the Hubble Space Telescope. And you'll notice that there are astronauts in a little space taxi that are hovering around the space telescope. You'll also notice that the space telescope is co-orbiting with the space station. The reason that that is necessary is because based on 1952 technology, astronauts would be required to change the film in the Hubble Space Telescope. This was our vision of the technology that would be needed in order to investigate and explore space. And so you would need a human space station with 75 or more people on it and a variety of infrastructure pieces in order to maintain what are today robotic facilities like the Hubble Space Telescope. When Arthur C. Clarke, the famous science fiction writer and the so-called father of communication satellites, proposed the concept of communication satellites in 1945, he insisted that astronauts would be needed either on the communication satellites or on space stations nearby to change the vacuum tubes in the communication satellites. At that time, when we formulated what is still today the dominant vision of space exploration, the assumption was that there would be very little remote sensing and that communication to and from space would be extraordinarily difficult. So therefore, the model for space exploration was one that was essentially based on 17th and 16th century terrestrial voyages where brave humans in small ships went out across the seas to explore lands essentially cut off from their home base for years at a time. And that provides the basis for the next sort of fuzzy image that we have right here. This is a poster done by Robert McCall for the 1968 movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. What is important about this movie is that it occurred one year before the landing of the moon and is based upon the NASA long-range plan, then under formulation, published in 1969 by a group called the Space Task Group, a great Washington, D.C. name, in which they laid out the post-Apollo space program. And this was to require a large orbiting space station that would rotate. And the reason that it rotates is because of its primary purpose. Its primary purpose is to take humans from Earth, transfer them to a space station, and then lead them onto the moon. It rotated in such a fashion that it duplicated the gravity that a person would experience on the moon. It was run by the Hilton Corporation. Pan Am ran the space shuttle, which you see in the lower part of the picture. And people would come from the Earth to the space station, get ready to go onto the moon. And then by 2001, according to the screenplay, we would have human missions in the outer solar system, exploring, depending upon which version of the movie you read, either Jupiter or Saturn. And this would open up vistas that we could barely imagine. And for those of us who saw the movie in 1969, 1968, barely understand. Nonetheless, look at the space shuttle in this. This is a very important concept here because it is a winged space shuttle with essentially 28 seats. It is designed precisely to be a low-cost human carrier between Florida and a large space station in low Earth orbit. That was its primary purpose in 1968 when the movie came out. The following year, NASA canceled the Saturn V production line. And as a consequence, the space shuttle was given an additional function. Not only would it carry crews to and from an Earth orbiting space station, it would also have to carry the space station to and from Earth and the Earth orbiting space station. And so it has a very large payload bay. In order to sell the program in Washington, D.C., NASA not only had to sell it as the primary delivery mechanism for the crew, for the equipment, and for the space station itself, it also had to enlist the support of the Defense Department, which could use it to launch reconnaissance satellites. The payload bay on the space shuttle, if I'm not speaking too far ahead here, is basically designed to hold a reconnaissance satellite. 
That dictated its size in the budget battles that occurred in the White House during 1969 through 1972. And as long as you've got that big a payload bay, you can also use it to deliver commercial satellites. And you can also use it to deliver scientific payloads. In fact, the space shuttle can be a mini space station. Properly outfitted, it can stay in orbit for up to 30 days, although we've never done a mission like that. It has stayed up with Space Lab for many days and acted as a precursor to a large rotating space station. And it's also supposed to cut the cost of space flight by a factor of 10, increase reliability well beyond the expendable launchers that were used in the 1960s, be easy to fly, and have wings and land at uh, at least airport-like landing facilities. These were all the requirements that were imposed upon the in typical Washington fashion. And as a result, as the Game and Board pointed out after investigating the Columbia accident, the shuttle doesn't do all of those things very well. It does a few things very well, but it doesn't accomplish the objectives that were originally set out in the vision. What's happened in the human spaceflight program is that the, the actual reality of human spaceflight has been transformed considerably from the original vision, the vision that's represented there and in the previous, in the previous slide. The space shuttle is not primarily a low-cost ferry to and from Earth orbit. It has multiple functions which compromises its ability to accomplish all of those. No longer delivers commercial satellites, no longer delivers scientific payloads, and in fact will be restricted strictly to supplying and constructing the International Space Station. And it certainly is no cheaper than the rockets we flew in the 1960s, which was its primary and its original objective, but transformed through the political process. And the space station isn't round, doesn't rotate, and is not a stepping stone to the moon and to Mars. It is essentially a microgravity research laboratory in space, again transformed from the original concept through the political process. One other characteristic of the space station, and this is very important for conceiving what the technology of space stations are, the space station was supposed to be run from space, not from the Johnson Space Center. Like the bridge on the Starship Enterprise, the people who were on the space station were supposed to run it. Now, why did they want to have that? It's for a very simple reason. A human expedition to Mars is nothing but a space station that leaves Earth orbit and travels across the solar system. And if you're going to go to Mars, you have to be at least semi-autonomous. You can't rely upon mission control to fly the vehicle. But that as well got transformed through the political and the bureaucratic process. Now go back in your minds to that Hubble Space Telescope and remember the astronauts changing the film and changing the vacuum tubes. And let me share with you this picture from the late 1990s. That's the Mars Pathfinder mission and the Sojourner rover, which is off by itself investigating rocks and communicating back through the lander. That was followed this January by much larger rovers, essentially 300-pound geologists landed on opposite sides of the planet, and they too were exploring Mars, communicating directly back to Earth and through satellites around Mars. What's interesting about this particular mission is this is how we got to Mars and explored it, and it was done for 1 14th of the cost of what we spent to put landers on the red planet in 1976. The real breakthrough in Mars Pathfinder and Spirit and Opportunity has been the cost reductions that they have achieved. If you do a straight cost-to-cost -cost comparison between these 300-pound geologists and the Viking landers, the new robot geologists cost one-fourth of what that mission did 24 years earlier. People working in the robotics field have achieved very significant cost reductions, the same sort of cost reductions that people hoped we'd achieve with the human spaceflight program and the space shuttle. How did they do it? Through microelectronics. The camera, which is on the lander, on the Pathfinder lander, is about that big, about as big as your hand. It's a very small unit. And uh, it has the capability of taking what is called electronic film. There are 12 cameras on Spirit and Opportunity rovers, some of them no larger than uh, a big stamp. And yet they have the capability of resolution that is as good as the human eye. Advances in miniaturization and microelectronics have allowed us to do things that were both 
impossible 20 years ago, and also much more expensive when we could do them. So advances in microelectronics of the sort that produces desktop computers of advanced space exploration. And the way in which these missions are organized is very different. It doesn't take 16,000 people to place a lander on Mars. They use organizational techniques similar to the ones that you see in Microsoft, new project management techniques that rely upon very small teams to carry out the work of the mission. And they also, frankly, take risks that are not typically taken in tax finance space programs. Altogether, on the robotic side, that has resulted in technological advances, space telescopes that don't need some people to change the film, and also substantial cost reductions. Let me show you one example of that. Before I do that, you've got to take a picture of the Hubble Space Telescope in your mind. Basically, it's a reconnaissance satellite that points up instead of down, if you, if you will. It's about 60 feet long. It's a very large structure. It's the first of four great observatories. NASA wanted to build four great observatories. The fourth great observatory in the line was the Infrared Space Telescope Facility, now known as the Spitzer. It was proposed to be built the same way we built the Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble Space Telescope cost about $2 billion, and so the astronomers in proposing this about 12 years ago said to the Congress, it's going to cost about $2 billion again. And how much is it going to weigh? About 12,000 pounds wet, fully fueled with the helium that it needs to cool it down so that it can conduct its operations. Congress looked at that and said, thank you very much. Come back when it's cheaper. And so NASA did. They went in and they used a variety of technological advances to reduce both the size and the cost of the facility. They cut the cost by a factor of four. They cut the size by a factor of 10. That is the real space telescope that's used to do infrared measurements. It is in space now and operating. It shows you the advances that have been made technologically. I'll tell you a little secret as to why they've occurred in the robotic program and then conclude by saying what would get us to the moon and Mars. You know why the space program made so many advances in the 1960s? Because it had competition from the Soviet Union. There's a lot of competition in the robotic space program. There's a lot of people that are making proposals that fight against one another, and very few of them get funded. And they only get funded if they can show advances in technology and show advances in cost reduction. And in, this, in the same way that this has affected the robotic program, the human spaceflight program hasn't had that kind of focus and that sort of competition in the last 30 years. And advances have not come as rapidly, or at least they haven't come on the same schedule that was envisioned by people who were thinking about the future during the 1960s. Are we going to go back to the moon and Mars? I think we will, but three things have to happen. One, you have to see the same cost advances on the human spaceflight side that we've seen on the robotic side. Why can't it occur? It's occurred in aviation. It's occurred in microelectronics. It's occurred in the robotic spaceflight program. There's no reason that the same cost advantages cannot occur. There's nothing intrinsically or technologically unique about human spaceflight that restricts our ability to cut the cost of conducting human spaceflight missions and achieve that much sought after cost reduction of a factor of 10. So it will have to be done on the cheap because there is no new money to conduct the program. It has to be done entirely out of NASA's existing budget, which means that if we're going back to the moon, we have to do it for 40 to 60 percent of the cost of the Apollo program. And that means using new technologies, and it means a new NASA. NASA, if we go back to the moon and Mars, will not be the same organization that it is today. In 1961, nobody in NASA knew how to go to the moon. The NASA of 1969 was a totally transformed organization. And in a similar sense, NASA on the human spaceflight side particularly will need to be transformed if we're to carry out this mission at low cost. There are a lot of proposals floating around inside the Beltway in Washington, D.C. One is to transform the field centers into federally financed research and development corporations similar to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the Applied Physics Lab. That tends to send earthquakes and, <laughs> and tremors uh, through the existing field centers. But however it occurs, and we don't know any more than we knew in 1961 how NASA would be transformed, the, the current NASA organization, as it's set up, is not ready to do low-cost missions to the moon and Mars. So there's a transformation that will need to take place. And NASA finally needs to be focused. It needs to have the 
discipline that is created by a single objective. People in NASA and in the space community for 35 years have been calling for a long-range objective, and now their wishes have come true. And I think it makes some of the people in the, in the business a bit nervous because for 30 years, people in the space community have gotten used to the drift that occurs in the absence of a vision and a long-range objective. 1962, NASA executives, scientists, and engineers had to decide how we were going to the moon. And there were all kinds of interest groups within NASA. Some wanted to use a huge rocket in a technique that was called direct ascent. Others wanted to build a space station or an Earth rendezvous point and use that to go to the moon. And an engineer at the Langley Research Center came up with the nuttiest idea of all, which was to rendezvous around the moon. With one astronaut remaining around the moon, two going to the surface and then coming back up, the risks were incredible. And yet, when they sat down at the tables, everybody said, what do we want to do? And they all agreed, we want to get to the moon by the end of the decade. And that was the way that worked. And so they chose it. So the question before NASA is, does it have the discipline to not do the things that are not related to the program and focus on the changes that have to be made, which is the ultimate question. Will we go to the moon and Mars? And the question goes right back to NASA. How much do you want to go? Because if you really want to go to the moon and Mars, the agency is capable of it. But if we just want to continue the same kind of incremental policy drift that we've had for 35 years where every space facility on the human spaceflight site has to be everything to everybody, strange political coalitions often defy the known laws of physics. So if people really want to go, they can probably do it. But it'll be a new NASA and it'll be different kinds of space programs and a much more refocused agency. Thanks for the opportunity to come and share those thoughts with you. I was just going to present you a few slides. Sorry, uh, we couldn't find the CD. The CD that shows all the slides has been uh, is circulating all across the nation by some of my coworkers. So I'm doing the old-fashioned way, so we can have an electromagnetic impulse hit the room, and we'll still see the image there. And it's going to be uh, astronaut training, basically flights, jobs, and more. And simply because, uh, as an astronaut, you get over there to the Johnson Space Center, and for the first two years. They feed you with a fire hose of all the knowledge, and uh, you end up knowing everything but not remembering anything at all. So it is a continuous process where the training just goes on and on and on. When I travel, I, uh, I carry some of my books with me to keep reminding myself of procedures and all that. Uh, when we're not flying, of course, and, uh, and that's been my case, uh, we do other jobs. We consult, uh, we serve as uh, consultants to the different design teams. We bring in the crew input. Because even though I, uh, you're probably not flying in space, you're still part of that training team where, where you know how business is conducted up in orbit. So in a, I'm going to show you a quick slide. So what happens when you get to the Johnson Space Center after you've been selected as a, what they call astronaut candidates? And uh, the first thing is, uh, let's see if I can get this right. Oh, that is, uh, I was a uh, group 16 of NASA, and the flags you see around that patch is all the international partners that are uh, part of my class. Uh, John Glenn and company were group one, that uh, was group 16. Okay, first thing you do is they ship you off to Pensacola to learn uh, water survival because, uh, as you well know, the Earth is covered mainly by water and you don't know when you're going to have to ditch out there somewhere. Plus, we get training to fly uh, T 38 jets. And so we got to learn how to get out of the water or survive in the water. It's a great week out there. We do all kinds of practice. Uh, we're trained by the Navy, which is uh, one of the probably, they know a lot about water survival. Believe it or not, we were trained by a fellow that his main job in life for the Navy was to convince Navy pilots that are afraid of the water how to not to be afraid of the water. You know, believe it or not, people join the Navy and they're afraid to swim. But this fellow can change everybody's mind in less than five days. So we do uh, all kinds of training that you might see, just basically water survival. And, uh, and then we get to fly the jets, not like that. Uh, luckily for us in the astronaut office, all the, all the pilots, they come out from uh, test pilot school, and they're the best pilots in the world. And they're pretty humble about it. They say they're the best pilots in the world because they get to fly a lot. You know, they can, they're better than anybody else in the world because of practice, and that's what it's all about. You know, practice makes perfect. And in the United States of America, we get to, uh, 
you get to fly quite a bit if you're in the military. Unlike my, my uh, I was born in Argentina, and I found out two weeks ago, I couldn't believe this, they have uh, this A4s, and the pilots get to fly one hour per month. And to me, that's a uh, borderline suicide, flying a jet only one hour a month. I wouldn't do it. So that's uh, all dressed up and flying along. A lot of training because uh, when you're on a jet, especially if you're a civilian, you're not used to multitasking. You're flying at 500 knots. Things happen pretty fast, and you have to be ahead of the jet. As a matter of fact, my first flight on the jet, uh, I asked the instructor, well, how did I do since I was a civilian pilot and all that? And he goes, well, I'll put it this way. If we were to crash, you would have been safe because you were about 100 miles behind the airplane. <laughs> And uh, we also do the flights, the parabolic flights. Uh, you probably heard of the, the, this airplane that uh, does a parabola. And so for about 20 seconds or so, you know, you, you climb up. And then when you fall down, you get about 20 seconds of zero G. Obviously, uh, when you're pulling up, you're pulling about two Gs. And, and if you're not careful, you can get really sick. And that's, uh, everybody probably heard this at one time or another. They call that airplane the vomit comet. And it's pretty refreshing to know also that if you want to take a ride on a similar airplane, now there's a private company, I think out of Fort Lauderdale, that for $3,000 they'll take you up in about 40 parabolas. And it's a real neat exercise. You can see you're out there. Once you're in zero G, your, your average IQ drops down to about the five-year-old type of behavior. So, but it's an, And that was a freebie because the first ride, the first introductory ride, is always like go out, knock yourselves out. You don't have a mission. You don't have anything. Just go play and see what it's like. And uh, then other flights, you know, they're doing the Superman, and you can see I got all my plastic bags ready to go at a moment's notice if, uh, if my stomach doesn't feel good. But after that good flight where everybody gets their horse around and get an idea of what zero G is like, then you have other training issues where you will be doing some task on all those 40 parabolas. So. Uh, also, we practice uh, for spacewalks, EBAs. You know, you, you carry that cumbersome suit that is not really uh, user-friendly. We have a huge swimming pool, as you can see. It's 40 feet deep, and we put mock-ups. Normally, for a spacewalk, for every hour you spend doing a spacewalk, you train about 12 hours on the ground. And, and, and what are you supposed to train or what are you supposed to do? But mainly is knowing the task at hand. You will rehearse that task at hand so much that you will know it from memory. And that's where you practice because, as you can imagine, uh, the suit's only good for about maybe seven hours outside the vehicle, and there's a lot of work to be done. So in those seven hours, you have to optimize them as much as you can. Also, it's a suit that is uh, inflated four and a half psi. It's really cumbersome. You're like the Michelin man in it. You can, you know, if you have an itch, it's too bad. You're going to live with it like it happened to me. I had an itch for about four hours. I was looking you I was looking in a mirror and see why is my eye itching so much and there was this tiny little skin flake in there and I was trying to shake it off when I could and then all of a sudden you says gotta quit thinking about this and do the work. Pretty interesting how the human body adapts to all this. You get on the suit, you're really cumbersome, your motions your range of motion is pretty small, but within twenty to thirty minutes you can tune it all out. You can perform to the point where you don't feel that you're in the suit anymore. Now you do a lot of work because every time you, you extend, you're fighting that suit. Uh, for instance, picking something up, the gloves are made so your hand rests on the, if you ever see anybody that has a hand wrapped up or you know, in an accident, the hand sits like that. That's your normal resting position of your hand where your muscles are neither extended in any direction, they're relaxed. So if I wanna squeeze something, I have to fight those gloves that are four and a half psi, and then if I want to open my hand, it's like the old alligator trick that past this, you know, our muscles are good for gripping, but you cannot use your muscles to open your hand. So sometimes when it comes down to a tool, I end up putting my hand in there and let it snap on the tool. And uh, after six hours of doing that on that suit, believe me, you find muscles you didn't know you had, and the good thing about it is that you sleep really good at night, you know, after... I mean, that's a, the ultimate workout, being on that suit, you're in 100% oxygen, or not 100%, it's like nitrox, so it's got 40% oxygen. Your metabolism is going at 100 miles an hour. You're working so hard, uh, you, drink, you have a drink bag, and uh, put it this way, you can drink 
that whole bag, which is about two quarts of water in there, and you don't have to use your diaper. You wear a diaper too, just in case. But you're working and you're sweating so much. It's, it's pretty interesting. You do a lot of work, a lot of training, and you have a hell of a team that is teaching you all the tricks. And by the time you're done with your training, you've got a bag of tricks that is pretty nice. And you can't wait to take it up in space with you. Okay, there is uh, practicing on the spacesuit, and again, it's all rehearsal, it's all uh, knowing, it's like it's, uh, you have to be ready to do all the work you need to do. Okay, that is uh, in preparation for uh, wearing the launch and entry suit, those uh, yellow ones, we use them to go up and then come back. It's, uh, that suit can uh, take the vacuum of space, it's just you wear it on the shuttle in case of uh, an emergency, you lose cabin pressure, the suit comes up and, uh, and it will protect you on a good day. Uh, the blue garment there is uh, coils of water because once you get on that suit it gets hot really quick and you circulate uh, water through it. And I'll tell you what, if I had a suit like that, you can mow your yard on 120 degree weather and you'll be cold. If you plug your garden hose to it and you're just, you can be outside running and you're not going to sweat. It's really a really neat system. So, of course, you got to go through all the motions of getting in the suit. It's also cumbersome, but, you know, it's better than not having a suit when you need it. So that's the way you live. And there it is, all dressed up and no place to go. And uh, basically, that was uh, they fit you up. And you can see, if you look at the reflection on the mirror, I like this picture because of that the white on the back of the helmet. That's a reflective tape. And uh, the Navy tell us that they have uh, an infrared uh, flash in a, in, a, in a night vision system that it can actually see you 20 miles away on a dark night in the ocean. So if you're bobbing in the waves um, and they, they're looking for you, they will find you if everything else fails uh, based on that. I did a, what we call a mode 8 exercise, which is a bailout over the ocean. We went 40 miles offshore here off the Cape and uh, they drop you off in there and you're on your own. And nobody was coming, nobody was coming. It was like, what's going on? Forty minutes later, I was still bobbing in the ocean. Turns out that my emergency locator beacon never worked. And uh, so I started popping flares left and right until the Navy finally, the helicopter, which I couldn't even see, they came out and fished me out of the water. But um, So anyway, we, uh, we do training. Sometimes we do runs with the suit on because one thing is just sitting around with your shirt sleeve and, and throwing all the switches and reaching everything and once is when you have that suit where it gives you a tunnel vision you can't see in order to see to the side you have to move the helmet move your head so your reach and visibility gets quite compromised and if you think you know it all in a simulator and then they stick you on that suit now you're in a different world and again it takes you a few minutes to adapt to that I mean, it's amazing how the human body adapts to everything like I mentioned before Well, on a good day, the, you know, we're all that training, and you know, we spend hours and going over material and all that. Uh, some people ask me, "What do you like the least about the astronaut program?" And it's having those recurring nightmares of not being able to graduate because I forgot to take an elective on basket weaving 101, and I get those nightmares all the time. Where, or, or you're late, you know, you have a final exam at three o'clock, and you show up at five o'clock, and everybody's gone. Uh, you know, those nightmares that you think your life is over, and, and I'm getting those, and I have to tell you, if anybody knows the answer on how to get rid of those nightmares, please come see me. You, you know, you have a friend. A um, lot of studying, you know, a lot of material, and it's amazing that, you know, people say, oh, your memory goes bad as you get old and all that. I'll tell you what, if you exercise that memory, it's amazing how you can, you can remember. But you have to be selective and remember only the things that are going to save you, not, not the noise. You know, if, uh, if somebody is asking you what time it is, you don't have to tell them how to build a clock. You just tell them what time it is. So you, your memory becomes really selective. And at the same time, sometimes you can't even remember your phone number, so go figure. You know, but it's uh, highly memory intensive, um, quite a bit of uh, work, and, and it's good. So there's uh, our friends at Rocketdyne. You know, when on a good day, they give us three good engines, and they've been good at it. And you can see the solid rocket motors. This is one of my favorite pictures. That uh, the, the shuttle is just about going transonic, you know, going through the speed of sound and the atmospheric um, uh, qualities at that time. The you know the dew point, the water content of the atmosphere generates that shock wave. And for uh, some of you that are geeks like me, when it comes to aerodynamics, if you take the cotangent of that angle on that on that shock wave, it will give you the Mach number. So right there, you got about Mach 0.99. Trust me on that one. 
And we keep on going. It's great. It's a, it's a pretty incredible ride. You go in. How fast is fast? It's just really time. How, I'll tell you what. Yesterday I left home at about 1.30, 2 o'clock from Houston, 1,000 miles away, and Southwest Airlines put me in Orlando International at 2 in the morning. You know, go figure. Now, what you're watching right now, if something goes wrong in that shuttle, they can land in Spain, and you'll have wheel stop on the runway 17 minutes later. You know, that's how fast this thing is going. So there's not really much margin for, you know, looking out the window and saying, hey, what was that? Whatever that was that, it was gone. My biggest, uh, my biggest encounter with speed, I would say, was you're on a simulator, and you read the speed. And, of course, you're doing uh, 17,500 miles an hour in orbit. But when you re-enter, you're looking down and you're looking at the Mach number, and that's what dictates what you're doing. You know, Mach 17, Mach 15, wow, wow, it's a number. Well, one time I saw go the shuttle go overhead to land at the Cape on a night time at uh, Houston, and it was just like the meteorite. And I was thinking, my God, that is Mach 17. That is like, wham, gone. And the guys that were in it, they were looking at Houston and doing what is called a roll reversal, where you, you manage your energy by doing S-turns. They made a roll reversal, and they were looking at Houston, and then they come back, and, and uh, the, the pilot, which is one of my classmates, says, hey, Houston looks pretty good from, from the air. And the commander says, no, that is New Orleans, you dummy. You know, and that was like not even 30 seconds later. He was, they were like, I mean, they're going to town. It's uh, quite, a, quite a fast business. So once you're in orbit, you can, uh, that's one of my favorite pictures. It's like a sunset or a sunrise. You know, you get the same color as that orange. You can see how thin the atmosphere is. You know, it's pretty uh, thin compared to the rest of it, everybody claims. There's the Hubble. The uh, doctor was mentioning you can see the, the astronaut compared to the Hubble. It's, uh, it's quite a massive uh, machine out there. And uh, it was, the Hubble was built to be repair in orbit. You know, uh, if you all remember, all story Musgrave, he was the one that it was on top of that, making sure that it was uh, repairable because, um, you know, the advances in robotics and all that, it's, it's really good, but, but nobody can anticipate problems like a human operator can. So in other words, you, you go up to, to the machine that has to be serviced, you send the robot out there, and if something is not per configuration, the robot is as good as a programmer. You need the, the human operator in there. So... Uh, it's quite a successful program. And uh, more spacewalks. You know, the spacewalks, every module we take up to the station has to be hooked up. Uh, connectors, uh, power lines, uh, uh, fluid lines, uh, you name it, uh, it's all done. We're just uh, doing a lot of assembly work. Yeah, that's a view from the space station into the shuttle. Uh, another way of getting into space, uh, the Soyuz. That's a proton rocket. The Soyuz, very reliable. So we also get trained on Soyuz, on how to fly the Soyuz. And for that case, we get sent to Star City. I spent some time out there in Star City with the Russian program. Very robust piece of equipment. It's, uh, some people say, well, look at the Russians. It's kind of old. It's kind of a, like an antique. And, but I'll tell you what. It's basically what they need. Highly reliable in this uh, great system. Yeah, that's approaching the station with uh, when when you're coming in. We're not trying to shoot it down. It's just a a sight over there, so you know your orientation and your range is quite a uh, doing a rendezvous on the on the space station is uh, quite a bit of work, but really slow. And you, you keep taking measurements and looking at your target and your closing rates. You do a burn to get closer, farther away. It's quite a quite a neat uh, experience to uh, to do a rendezvous. So of course the station is there and uh, it's getting bigger. We got the hardware at the Cape. We've got quite a bit of hardware. We got all the European hardware at the Cape, just waiting for the shuttle to put it in space. Uh, and the shuttle is uh, the, the hardware we have left. The European module, the Japanese module, cannot be taken in any other vehicle other than the shuttle. So we're just uh, hoping to get back and to return to flight pretty soon and finish it up. Inside the cockpit, once you're in orbit, as you can see, you're just short sleep, no problem, life is good out there. But you, are, you, you don't have enough time. Fifteen days uh, is not enough. For, they load you up with uh, all kinds of work. It's, uh, when you see the astronauts floating around eating M&Ms or playing, that is like a, probably a 30-second 
uh, time out of your entire day. It's, uh, it's uh, all the missions. The Russians complain that Americans, you always want to do too much, and because the Russians are used to going in the rocket, getting to their station, you know, time is plenty. Well, with the shuttle, we can. We got to get there, do as much as we can, as fast as we can, and go from there. So that takes a lot of rehearsing on the ground. Everything we do is well rehearsed. So more. That is, uh, when we want to come home, we'll point the vehicle, the tail into the velocity vector and fire the orbital maneuvering engines, the ohms, slow down, uh, gravity does the rest, starts bringing it in, and uh, we just, uh, we got navigation on board. There is a picture uh, going right through the plasma, about 3,000 degrees outside the windows, and uh, all you're doing is monitoring that the, the vehicle is pointing the way it needs to point and uh, that all the systems are working. Usually, uh, it's a pretty exciting time. More pictures from the cockpit. As you can see, checklist all over the place. We live by the checklist. We die by the checklist. If uh, if you throw a switch and it doesn't say on the checklist to throw that switch, you'll probably get your knuckles uh, nailed by the instructor on the ground. And if you do that in space, the commander will probably uh, you know duct tape you to the side of the wall. So on a good day, uh, it's a good picture there. The shuttle coming in. You know, here it is, a vehicle that uh, weighs uh, on takeoff millions and millions of pounds and then less than 70 seconds is going supersonic and then slows down to uh, 190 knots, that's about 230 miles an hour to land. Very precise. And uh, we've seen that picture many times at the Cape. Hopefully we'll see it a lot many more times. So, but anyway, we're talking exploration. That's uh, an artist that tells us what the galaxy is, is you are here. And uh, if you look at the word you, that's about um, something like 10 light years. So if you point a flashlight into a place, and the other person's got to wait 10 years to, to see that light from your flashlight. It's huge. You know, and, and it's like, what's out there? Um, what's going to happen? How, how many riddles uh, we can answer? by looking at that picture. I mean, I, I can't imagine how far is far. I kind of have an idea how fast is fast, but, but in a very small scale. But how far is far, and how are we going to get anywhere if we do? But um, one thing that personally, uh, it always concerns me is the fact that we're, we are a one world species right now. The, the Earth has been taken out by asteroids in the past, you know, the dinosaurs. Uh, you look at uh, a lot of craters that they're pretty much, you can't see them right now unless you're from space, but an asteroid came in and just took out whatever it was there, Mass massive uh, extensions and all that. And I think one of the, the future of the space program has to do with finding out uh, if we got any asteroids lurking out there, which we do, that it might come over and pay us a visit, that uh, it's not going to be too much of a pleasant visit. And it's the job of the space program to identify and do something about those asteroids. Because that's it. Once that asteroid comes in, hit, and a few weeks ago we had one going by not far away. If, uh, if it would have hit us, it would, be over. it would have been all over. You know, um, those of you here, you suffered through uh, four hurricanes. And you know when an asteroid comes through, that is no hurricane. That is, you know, you wish you had ten hurricanes instead of that or maybe more. So I look at the future of the space program as a very important tool on saving humanity. You know, if we can uh, get our stuff together here on Earth and quit shooting each other and all that good stuff, um, probably we can do something about when somebody higher than us says enough of you and whack us with an asteroid and, and it's all over. So, and uh, space exploration, um, going to the moon, following on to Mars, uh, you know, John Young, Apollo 16 astronaut, which is still with us, he, he says, for starters, we shouldn't go farther than two days away from a can of beans. And probably that wraps it up and how far we should go to begin with. The space program, I think, uh, before we run, we got to crawl, so incrementally over time, and that's the vision of uh, President Bush that has put for NASA, is to keep going in a direction. It's not up to him or the next administration, it's a combined, you know, uh, NASA train of thought mission you know goals that uh, they, they have to be revised they have to be adapted to and and so on 
So we're there, and uh, we all know it, and it's great to be in Florida. You know, I live on a place where people pay $200 a day to get away from, and people pay $200 a day to come here to Florida. So I'm happy today, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, one of the programs I work, I used to work on a B-1 bomber, my old-time favorite airplane. I think he's great. It's a good machine. It, uh, did quite a bit of work, uh, and I'm proud of uh, having served on that. But it is, uh, you know, there it is for my heckling friends out there. We all fly that kind of airplane. That was, uh, you know, a yellow airplane is the most beautiful and better than any other airplanes. And anyway, the, the key, I, I brought that picture in there because uh, just one thing happened today, which I'm really happy, was the fact that uh, Burt Rutan, the designer of that airplane, won the X Prize. They made it into, uh, uh, into the edge of space. And they're collecting a cool $10 million, but I heard they spend about $21 million getting up there. So, you know, $10 million, I'll take it even if I still owe another 10 or 11. So I was pretty happy to hear those news. I think it uh, shows how great America is where uh, a group of people can actually build something to go to the edge of space. So I think the imagination is, is a limit uh, in this great country of ours. And with that, after I built that airplane, we built a little co-pilot there. She's now at, uh, eight years old, and she's my kitchen pass. Whenever I want to go fly, and I go, tell mommy we're going to go fly. And so I get to go to the airport whenever I want right now, or whenever she wants. And, uh, and it's great. So uh, with that, uh, concludes my presentation. Again, it's been great. It's a really exciting time to be alive in the space program. We have a lot of work to do, and as long as we have work to do, we'll keep pressing on. And uh, this, uh, just overall, I'm I'm happy, and I hope you're too. And thank you very much. Thank you.